Hi, everybody. Welcome. Thanks for coming back to another episode of That Early Childhood Nerd. I'm Heather Burnt Santi. Finally, yay, Lisa Murphy is on with me again. <laughs> yay! It's nice to be back. It's been a long time since uh, since we've recorded together. At least it feels like it. I have no concept of time in the last few Well, months. and selfishly, I'm loving the topic that is my uh, my comeback. Your comeback? Uh, yeah. My comeback with you topic. Yeah. So we're going to talk about nursery rhymes. Um, and the reason this was on my mind is uh, because I taught uh, an emerging literacy class um, the second eight weeks of, of this semester. And um, so, of course, we talked about the value of nursery rhymes and all the things we're going to get into about why that's valuable. Um, but I found, again, that nobody knows what nursery rhymes any are anymore. When I talk about nursery rhymes, none of these students knew what it, what it really meant. And they'd never heard of Mother Goose. And, and let me just say, I'm this is not a, oh, kids these days, they don't right, know the right, good right, stuff. Right, right, right. Because these were people of all ages. And then I remembered that when I... Um, when I got the book uh, that we're using for our quote today, Reading Magic by Mem Fox, um, several years ago, and I was working in a toddler classroom, I went out and bought a board book of nursery rhymes when I read that because I remembered that I, you know, I had sort of put them aside too. Um, and it was so much fun to read with them, but a lot of those teachers didn't know what it meant, what any of it was. They were trying- Okay, so I'm going to ask a, a perhaps- So it was sad for me. Sure, as it would be. How, did they not know? Did they not know the rhymes, or had they not ever really heard of the notion of mm -hmm. a nursery rhyme? Yeah. So, in the class that I did this semester, it was a little of both. And okay. to be fair, one of them was not a native English speaker. So, I suppose we clarified too that we're talking now about learning English language and learning to read in English. And I don't know what the research says about other languages and their cultures, you know, rhymes True. and things. But um, so, so they both, you know, I, I said, have, have you heard of Mother Goose when they didn't know what a nursery rhyme and they had, they did not. And I said, so like, excuse me, bless me. Bless <laughs> Mary had a little lamb and they were like, mm. and so wow. I said, twinkle, twinkle, little star. And they were like, oh, I know the song twinkle, twinkle, little star. So, so with that group, um, it was mixed with the teachers that were in and out of my room in that toddler room with the little board book of Mother Goose. Um, it just seemed like um, one in particular had no idea what she was reading. And I don't feel like she was maybe 10 years younger than me. So I don't feel like it's an age wow. thing. Um, well, uh -huh. But but anyway, I, I feel like that's a real loss. So let me read the quote quick, quick before okay, we get, before we start un read unpacking the quote this. Real quick. Real quick. <laughs> this is from Mem Fox Reading Magic. And she says, experts in literacy and child development have discovered that if children know eight nursery rhymes by heart by the time they're four years old, they're usually among the best readers by the time they're eight. The end. The end, period. So that's, our, that's our starting point, is that nursery rhymes are important, and I want to talk about it because I'm finding that um, folks don't use them as much as in well, my I, early career. If you wanted, you there's probably a couple organic offshoots with that, is mm -hmm. depending on your age, you know, were you a part of the generation where there was some pushback and backlash against the nursery rhymes where we weren't allowing ourselves to necessarily see the, the literacy value and we got a little distracted and sure. sidetracked by some of the imagery and some of the language and things like that, which, you, you know, I, I guess me personally, I think there's room to push back against the pushback a little bit. Sure. Um, you know, because especially if some of the if some of the poems or the nursery rhymes that were written in response, like the counter one, if it's still providing the same rhythm and banter and rhyme and mm -hmm. pattern, yeah, then it's like, okay, you want to read Mother Goose or Father Goose, Father Gander sure. or whatever, sure. knock your bad <laughs> self out because at the end of the day, it's that rhyming piece that sticks, right? Yeah. And, yeah. And so, so many choices out there too. I used to tell everybody, go get the, the black and white checkered book. And some of your readers and viewers and listeners, you got it right there. I've got like three copies. I have this me. and a little checkered board book. That's that's the classic book. Yeah. And I would tell them, I because I used to do a nursery rhyme workshop where um, we read the nursery rhyme and then I would like present activities like to stretch it, to get mm -hmm. it out of the circle time area. Yeah. But I found that it was falling on deaf ears. Yeah. Again, no disrespect. It's not a kids these days, like you said, yeah. but it's like, 
I the goal was the, the goal was to extend the rhyme, but if you didn't even know the rhyme, right, then it's totally out of context. So it was like, okay, we need to shelve this for a little bit, right, and and perhaps circle circle back to it. Yeah, um, I think you make a good point. I think this can sort of go back to, and this is not. You know, I have nobody's done any research that I've seen about this specific thing, but I bet we could go back to No Child Left Behind and people mm. veering away from nursery rhymes um, and and children. You know, some of my students were children in in the 90s getting their um, uh, getting their education then. When um, we were like, but so when that when that shifted and we thought, well, now it all has to be academic. And we started to think of early childhood education as academic training instead of um, childhood. Mm. Uh, uh, That makes sense because these nursery rhymes are playful. They're fun. They're silly. And that would not be seen as, as we know, people moved more towards phonics and flashcards and uh, literacy worksheets and literacy (laughs) curriculums um, that focused on... um, sort of separating skills and teaching them explicitly in ways that young children uh, are not ready for yet, rather than, and that's what I was sort of talking to my students was about was learn these so that you can not only do them during a circle time or a story time, but just when you're playing or just when you're outside or when you're walking, you can sort of recite them and um, one of their assignments. Like the transitions, right? So yes. you know, you've got five minutes and you're waiting for lunch that's late. Yeah. Um, you know, you're at a loss if you don't have a couple of handful of things memorized. And I think yeah. I think the whole chant, nursery rhyme, finger play song can yeah. all come under that same umbrella as a transition tool, right? Yeah. It's not we're we're not wasting time. We're not just being silly. Right. Um, and and I think that gets pushed back too is like, oh, if somebody walked in and I'm singing apples and bananas or, <laughs> you know, Mary, Mary had a little lamb, yeah. what are they gonna think of me? Um, you know, is that really what I'm supposed to be doing? And I think, you know, whether you read Mem Fox or the, or the more scholarly article that you sent yeah. to me. Um, yeah, we'll get to that too. <laughs> no, and I love that. Like, like Mem Fox says, uh, memorize them and you'll be a better reader. Yeah. And in, in one paragraph and this, this article that is peer reviewed <laughs> and is 15 pages long, essentially says exactly yeah. The same thing. So this yeah. is for like everyday folk. And then this is for the ones who the, need the peer all review, the, all the wolves who need a peer <laughs> reviewed justification and rationale for doing quite honestly, yeah. what we've known for a thousand years and, 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 or at least hundreds of years, I'll say that. Yeah. Um, and I've always <clears throat> and forever been in, and, and, you know, rein me back in if this turns into the, the Lisa show. So I we love the Lisa been, show. I've always been intrigued and you know this about me as to the origin of them and how, and how they never were intended for children, Mm -hmm. at least not initially. They were all body songs and stories. If if you go back through this black and white book that I'm holding that the listeners won't be able to see, some of them are maybe not ones you want to quote and memorize (laughs) and use with children. (laughs) You have to apply some critical thinking to it, but but yeah, that's not their, yes, inter- their and, or their origin origin. And I think there's 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 enough in the catalog, so to speak, in, in the canon of nursery rhymes that that you don't need to pick out some just for the shock value, right? Mm-hmm. You've got other choices. Yeah. So maybe not the hill I'm gonna die on. <laughs> um this morning, as I was um, over preparing for this, because yes. I got up at four, because you know who sleeps anymore once you're 52. I mean, you <laughs> well, know, I've you started just... taking some medicine, so I so, sleep well. Now. <laughs> maybe you can let me know what that is. So I did this total deep dive. I ended up buying the the Opie uh, uh, Oxford Nursery Rhyme Excellent. Dictionary yeah. because it has a lot of the origin and the history of them in there, and a little bit of the debunking. You know, so like sure. a, a lot of times we think that certain things are representative yeah. of like of ringing around things. the rosy isn't like really ringing about around the, the rosy. Plague. And I'm guilty of perpetuating Me that too. for a long time till yeah. I did my homework, and you're like, oh, it's not about that. Yeah, I mean, but then the other book that I was reading the heavy words lightly thrown, yes. the reason behind the rhyme, one of the things that I love about how he starts it is he says, you know, once you've convinced yourself that there's an, an origin, um, you're gonna see one, uh-huh. whether it's the oh. actual authentic origin yeah. or or not. Well, that's um, literature, right? That's that's literature criti- criti- criticism. We, we read into it and we pull what 
we get from it and we discuss it and we share it and so anyway i, I was gonna i was gonna read this to you um when it's talking about um uh higgity piggity my black hen and he said in all possibility the rhyme is just simply about a hen that was a good layer right um similarly it's high it's it's highly likely that once somebody's son called john did go to bed with his trousers on and his mother elected to commemorate the event with a rhyme um the difficulty is is that once you start seeing meaning you can't find excuse me you can find it anywhere yeah and people have been looking for a very long time and here's here's what i want to finish with as with conspiracy theories if you start <laughs> with the assumption that there is an ulterior meaning it is much easier to find one sure so so yeah. one of the things i liked about the heavy words lightly thrown is and he acknowledges this right here he said this collection attempts to strain out the more outlandish theories and select those for which there is more historical support mm, yeah. and so the nerdy in me was like "Ooh, yeah ooh. yeah it's like <clears throat> i mean i'm sure some of them started like um steve's walking around my house making up nonsense songs for the cat yeah <laughs> that's probably where some of them came from but it's it's not the meaning of the nursery rhyme that is so valuable for pre-readers right it's it's the, the font, font, so phonical, phonological awareness is the big piece that makes this valuable. And that's the article we read was um, Nursery Rhyme Knowledge and Phonological Awareness in Preschool Children uh, by Lori Harper. And it was in the Journal of Language and Literacy Education. Um, that it's mostly about nursery rhymes just inherently because of the rhyme and the rhythm and the patterns um, build a foundation for recognizing the alphabet like you, before you can sort of figure out the alphabetic alphabetic principle or whatever it's called where each letter has a sound and together they make words you have to understand that the words you are hearing can be broken into different parts and some and and you know bat is three sounds and you you have to be able to understand that before you can understand b b a a to, you know, and put them together for bat. And so it's the rhyme, it's the playing with language. Most it's, definitely. Um, but also it's the engagement with nursery rhymes. Like you're not going to get that from a flashcard or hooked on phonics or zoo phonics um, necessarily. It, it's when, when they see an adult having fun and they hear words that are silly and um, they want to engage with it. And it's not a chore. It's not a lesson. Um, although well, to that, I'm going to add to that because I think that's very important is the intention behind the use of them. Right. Mm -hmm. So yeah. if I memorize them and realize that there's this fun pattern in this sing songy now, if I, I already know them. So to me, it was second nature mm -hmm. to just be plopping them in. I was never plopping them in because this is going to increase your understanding of phenomes yes yeah. phonological <laughs> awareness i mean I, that wasn't the intention at all um but but then when i started doing my own deeper dive into reviewing the state standards and all the wolf language and all that yeah it's like huh producing a rhyme in response to an oral report an, an oral prompt was present yeah. in almost every single state's kindergarten standards and so i'm you know you go back uh you know just kind of anecdotally to the classroom and i'm like you, you know jack and jill went up the and all the kids whatever they're doing are like hey yeah <laughs> and because we've done it right yeah. so they, they know it and and i my caught my my concern is that people start overthinking it right like now m maybe maybe an art couple articles come out about how nursery rhymes are magic when it yes. comes to you know language yeah. and literacy and pre-reading skills yeah. and then then it loses it loses the the joyfulness out right. of it like so i it's, don't it's a validation of what we what we know is right but because it's in this scholarly article now or in the literacy textbook, we have to um, present it as a, a lesson or, or do yeah, you something. don't need a kit. It's, it's not just the, the play and you can extend things and you can talk about your workshop where you used to offer ideas for extensions sure. for nursery rhymes, but it's not, oh, I have to buy a nursery rhyme curriculum now. Yeah, th yes. And I want to make sure everybody listening realizes that that is not you, you, you are well, and I'm, 
I'm wary of anything that has to come from outside the people yes. hanging out with the kids anyway, Absolutely. but that's a, that's a whole other conversation, yes. which we've probably already had um, <laughs> five times probably. Yeah. So much like I think this, the spirit behind approaching nursery rhymes would probably be the same spirit behind the finger play songs, which is memorize them because yeah. you can't do anything until you've memorized right. them. Right. If you find that you're not liking the words in some of them, then pick another one. You literally have thousands yeah. to choose from here. Yeah. So you don't want to get hung up on, um, you know, that stuff. Well, you, you, I mean, you can get hung up on it, but don't, don't throw the baby out with the bathwater, mm -hmm. right? If you read a couple of them and you're like, Hmm, this is a little dated. Well then turn the page and pick another yeah, one. There are so many. There are tons. Yeah. Tons. I, one of the things that I had the students do this semester was um, to find some nursery rhymes and then record themselves um, reciting it. Well, they didn't have it memorized yet, so they were reading it. Um, but you know, at least it's an introduction for them now that those are out there. But as I was watching their videos, even though it was pretty much just reading it in a very A, B, A, B, A, B kind of way, I kept thinking, this is so fun. The language in this is so fun. And the stories are so silly. And <laughs> of course, this is going to be engaging for children. And if we can just add that memorization so that we can just do it naturally and be playful ourselves, it's going to be so powerful for what we know children need to be able to learn to read later, that yes. phonological awareness and figuring out rhymes. And, um, you know, we know that, or one of the things I think Mem Fox talked about was if children understand rhyme, then they become better readers because it helps them decode if they understand that there's a rhyming pattern. But again, the tendency for some people is to then do like rhyming flashcards or, yeah. um, uh, you know, just those kinds of things or quiz about rhymes, what rhymes well, with cat, but it can be done so much more playfully organically. and authentically uh, organically. Yes. Organically. Like you don't need to complicate it, <clears throat> but I think that is just, it's just another example about how our culture, at least maybe our Western culture uh -huh. has, has, We've we've aired on the side for so long of thinking that learning is something a kids don't want to do and that it needs to be complicated and that we need to delegate and third party it out to some kind of expert mm -hmm. person who made a kit or something. Mm -hmm. We've spent money. So therefore it's now like it's free. Yeah. Yeah. It's free. It's yeah. free. <laughs> like why would you yeah. make it harder? But we don't trust it or we don't well, well. Or maybe we never knew about it, right? If you're mm -hmm. saying that you have people coming into your class who are like, really? A nursery rhyme? Huh. So, okay, you don't know what you don't know. Yeah. So I think it would be tricky perhaps though. Do you get into having to convince people that something so simple can be so important yeah. and, and, and that it doesn't have to be harder? Yeah. And I think that's where these, you know, these articles, the, the peer review, the studies that are done, can come in handy because some people just need that language sure. to even listen to you. Sure. But um, like when you're talking with a family, so, you know, one of the other things they did in the class is each week they had to, after, you know, so each week we would talk about a different element of building that literacy foundation. And it, there is one of their assignments for each week was to take the information that they got today and write a, write an answer to a parent who said, what do you do to get them ready to read? Ah. And, and they had, and then at the end, they had to do a flyer that incorporated everything. So, um, so that, that kind of thing, we need to just be able to say, uh, you know, we don't go out to a parent at the end of the day and say, well, we're using, you know, research shows, blah, 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 blah. But we can say, you know, she really had so much fun today um, reciting Jack and Jill with me while we were swinging. And I love it because that's giving her so much practice with da 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 and we we have to have we have to have that rationale but we don't have to like pathologize everything and make everything we need an evidence-based yeah. expensive curriculum in here to do this when i talk about the wolf language and learning the wolf words i mm -hmm. I, I kind of joke that i don't know how infested you are with the wolves right <laughs> so some of you need to lead with non-newtonian fluid <laughs> Yes. Some of you call it a suspension. Some of you call it chemistry. Some of you can say science. Some of you can just say we had a lot of fun in the oobleck. And, right. and so the educator, the adult, the other in the room 
I feel very strongly that we need to have the ability to tap into where, wherever on that continuum yeah. we need to be. Now, right. ideally, we wouldn't have to defend it at all. Yeah. Right. Well, even if it's not defending, it's it's or advocating for play. Justifying and or whatever. Yeah, teach, yeah. You know, just teaching parents who don't know it. But, um, you know, th- this fits in nicely because last week's episode is my, was Mike and I talking about evidence-based curricula and the issues with everything having to be evidence-based. Um, and that's, I think, oh, I especially true. That. Oh, sure. But that's especially true with language and literacy in- instruction in early childhood um, because it's, it's, it's academic training in the, in that context. It's not, um, you know, just supporting what we know, to what be, we what know to be true people. and what they can do and what, what builds on what, um, and that's the professional we need to be the one who understands that stuff, not the one who, you know, checks off the, all the things on the dress code and is never late for work and that all those ideas of professionalism, but it's having what? the knowledge and being able to incorporate it, um, apply it right apply it authentically and and organically and ideally through play (laughs) and with play and around play in the the um play therapy class that i'm i'm taking right now one of the phrases she uses a lot during the lectures is that um you need to think clinically based on the information that you have you got to think clinically based on the theory Mm. and she's like but you need to know the theory before you can riff on the theory. Right. And I was like, it's like jazz, right. It's like being a musician. You got to learn notes and the chords and the progressions before you can go and improv. And I was like, you know, that very much fits with us here too. You Mm -hmm. can read all these books and articles that are here behind both of us, you know, but if you don't know how to implement it and not just implement it the way, maybe the book said, but how does this particular group need me to implement this? That's but, th- but then honestly, that's what we've been saying for the last 10 years is that at the end of the day, all these kids that are graduating now, you know, they can regurgitate the right answers until right. the cows come home, but they don't know how to apply. Yeah. And that's, knowledge. that's what happens with these, um, curriculums that we're buying, um, <clears throat> which you to, don't need, which you don't, which need, you do which not you need, need. <laughs> but the curriculums that are buying that are being bought, um, <clears throat> is, is that it doesn't require the teacher necessarily to understand why they're doing those things. So you can't deepen it. You can't extend it. You can just, um, read the script or, um, do it the same way over and over and over again, rather than let me circle that comment that you just made back to nursery rhymes. Yeah. This is why I have, um, I don't know if Heather and I, if, if you and I have ever uh, actually unpack the, the handful of Lisa Murphy non-compromisables if I was to start working. No, but I want to. <laughs> <laughs> but one of them of late um, is, uh, I call it third partying, uh, is delegating out, outsourcing the singing of the songs. So the nursery rhyme thing could be here too. If you mm-hmm. got a smart board and you're plopping up some you know, character cartoon- YouTube channel of some, of children's of some songs. Anima- mm-hmm. animated- spider crawling up the spout. No, mm-hmm. no, 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 no. Yeah. And for the record to anybody listening and watching that might be new to me, it's not that I'm a Luddite and I, I get it. Tech, tech, <laughs> we use technology tech right now, right? <laughs> yeah. What I don't like is that that thing up on the screen doesn't know your kid, mm-hmm. doesn't know you, you memorize them. And then you can make it faster. You can make it slower. Mm -hmm. You can make it silly. You can go from the, the, um, you can throw a kid's name into it. You can personalize the the itsy bitsy spider (laughs) should become the great big spider. Oh, that's what we do. Spider, you know, Mm -hmm. but the thing on the YouTube can't follow the lead of, of the children. And so that's, that's rational number two as to why you just got to memorize, memorize, memorize. And the other thing I want to say, and it might be a little not out of context, but I just want to be sure it's captured in our yeah. conversation today is that a lot of times, especially parents, and this isn't a diss because you don't know what you don't know. Mm-hmm. Not everybody realizes or takes the time to consider that we were an oral culture, yes. verbal before we were literate. Mm-hmm. We talked to each other. Children need to have time to process to hear, to yeah. engage verbally, the verbal must come right. first. And that's one of the most important pieces that you can have, that you can, that of most important pieces of the process 
of being ready to read when reading is required of you um, is that oral. And, you know, I think about even, you know, I love the songs, the nursery rhyme songs are fun and you still get some rhyme and rhythm, but I think it's different when it's presented orally. Like you're going to, you're going to have a different rhythm maybe when you're just quoting a nursery rhyme or just sort of sing songing it um, without it being that one that they know and they sing every day. So I think it's a combination. Those songs are great and wonderful. I love to sing with children, but also memorize them so that you can just quote them through the day mm-hmm. and, and change rhythms a little bit. And well, them. and also for the ones like I'm thinking twinkle, twinkle, little star right now. Yeah. Most kids, most people know the song, yeah. whether they've called it or associated it with a nursery As rhyme. A nursery genre, rhyme. It, yeah. Does, yeah, it doesn't matter. But but even just that playfulness, right? We all know the song, but then one day during snack, Miss Lisa just goes twinkle, twinkle. Yeah. Little star, <laughs> right? They're like, wait a minute. It's kind of familiar. Right. Yes. What? What's yeah. happening? Yeah. Their oh, brain engages. Exactly. Because the brain's like oh, novelty. Ooh, yeah. something new. <laughs> exactly. Ooh. Ooh. And, and again, we, we forget or just maybe didn't know that that is crucial. Mm-hmm. We gloss over it because yeah. we drank the Kool-Aid of thinking that, that it's not enough. Mm-hmm. And, and, and dude, I'm telling you, it's enough. Yeah. And also it's easier to say, well, we use X, Y, Z curriculum and it's an evidence-based curriculum and blah, 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 than it is to go into all of this kind of understanding with people who, who need that. So the parent who comes in and says, how do you get them ready to read? You're not going to be able to regurgitate in that moment, all a hundred things that might be happening. So you can focus on one or you can say, oh, well, we did our, we did our literacy. You know, we did 10 minutes of literacy this morning at nine 30. And and then after you've been doing it for 35 years, you say, so you're thinking your two-year-old should start to read. (laughs) That's the Lisa Murphy response. Yeah, yeah. Always put it back on that, right? Right. Well, that's why the question was, what are you doing to get them ready to read? Not how do you teach them to read? So it was a little bit of a semantic game. You're wanting to know how we're getting them ready? Yeah, we'll see. Yeah. (laughs) But anyway. That can be frustrating to people and I don't do it to frustrate it. But the reason why I model that a lot is because I think we are often reactive Yes. to what we think we've heard and we'll make an assumption that we are in the head of that we know what the other person is yeah. asking and simply by mirroring it back i give them a just it, it's a, it, i'm not being a jerk about it yeah. but i'm modeling it back so that i can perhaps get a little bit more data or a little bit more clarity with them using yeah. their own language right so then i can then i can formulate a response. Yeah. Well, and, and most often I, I believe that, um, because, fa- you know, again, you don't know what you don't know. So you don't know what else to ask sometimes, but they've been sold from before they were even pregnant with that child they're bringing to you that it has to be educational and educational looks like letters, shapes, and colors. Mm-hmm. And so when they want to know from you, is my child learning? They're going to focus on those three familiar, measurable things that have been marketed to them. Unfortunately, unfortunately, so we have an opportunity and an obligation to reframe some of that and um, talk about how what's happening organically is not only good for them in the moment just because they're children and they deserve to play and language is fun, but also um, if that is really your concern, yes, this is contributing to to that process too. Which that I think is where the binder challenge, however many years, Mm -hmm. what's the anniversary of the binder challenge is having one or two articles Mm -hmm. that talks about either the centers you have in the room or Mm -hmm. the, not that you're rotating from center to center, but we have evidence of the areas that you've got organized Mm -hmm. options that are available just for that one parent or, you know, whoever that does need that peer reviewed Mm -hmm. rationale. And then the rest is going to be supported anecdotally, either through your own stories or from what they're going to witness and observe you know, when they're, when they're coming in, yeah, yeah. They're coming in. Um, I did, I, this, this article, the article yeah. article, uh, did share the 10 common nursery rhymes that they did use uh-huh. with working with the children for their study. Um, yeah. For the study. I'm going to say them for your, for your viewers. Yeah. They used, um, Humpty Dumpty, Twinkle, Twinkle, Little Star, Itsy Bitsy Spider, Jack and Jill, Hey Diddle Diddle, 
Hickory Dickory Dock, Mary Had a Little Lamb, Baba Black Sheep, Little Boy Blue, and Little Miss Muffet. Um, and those were what were used to do, to assess the children's existing knowledge of the nursery rhymes, and then they moved they moved forward from there. Uh -huh. And and I went through and I looked through the heavy words lightly thrown book because I was curious to see how many of them were in this book. And it was very culturally interesting because uh -huh. even though this book is very this is UK English, okay, sure. And he actually with the second edition had to do a whole preface for American readers who didn't understand what some of the I don't want to say slang because it wasn't slang. vocabulary, it was just but vocabulary yeah. Yeah. that was just foreign to uh -huh. American ears. And I just, I found that That's I found fun. That super, super interesting. Yeah. Um, and so some of them, because the, the scholarly article even specifically said, um, I believe Euro-American nursery rhyme yeah. knowledge. Um, and only four of them were in the book in the UK based oriented. Oh book. yeah. I think, yeah, I think they definitely started. Um, I mean, I know we, that they start in Europe, you know, but I, and I think a lot of it was, um, Oh, I can't think of the descriptor I want, but like around Germany and, and those parts of Europe, I think before it got into English before nursery rhymes got well, into they were English. traveling, right? So yeah. as everybody's wandering around, they're sitting Picking around the campfire and, and they're going to the pubs and, you know, everybody's just, again, an oral, oral culture. Yeah. We didn't start writing them down for a long time. Yeah. yeah. Like the seven, late 1700s, I think is, is some of the earliest ones that, that, that were, were written. Yeah. So um, that made me think of another value that I, that I see in nursery rhymes and that's, um, a broader vocabulary than sure. maybe just they hear in our conversation, especially if all the conversation they're hearing from us is directive, <laughs> like in, in so many childcare centers where all they hear from the adults is what or, they yeah, need to do instruction. and instruction. Yeah. But, um, so Jack and Jill went up the hill to fetch a pail of water. Fetch is a brand new fetch. word. They may know, um, bring or get, or find, um, but fetch pail. comes in there pail too. A pail be. of water, yeah. And then you know, Jack fell down, broke his crown, and Jill came tumbling after. Tumbling is new. A crown, who knows what that is? Mm -hmm. um, so just being able to playfully, maybe sort of expand on some of those no wor new words is valuable for future reading because the more words you know, the more the easier it is to decode when you're into that decoding phase. Um, it helps you, you know, to put the context clues together from the illustration and the words. Um, but also for children who have maybe speech delays or um, intelligibility um, issues where, where you can't understand what a child is saying, if they have more words for the same meaning, yeah. Then when they can't pull the one they want, they have others that they can, that they can maybe bring out. Oh, good point. Good yeah. Point. So it's, it's so, it's just fascinating to me that these things that we just do playfully and that we're just, you know, part of my childhood definitely have all this, this value. And I don't even really need to add to it other than to, to memorize learn it and, and incorporate and, it. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It's crazy. Exactly. Exactly. And I think if I could, well, maybe a little sidebar here, you do whatever I think you there, want. I know you. <laughs> you can do whatever you want. I can. Yeah. Um, sidebar, sorry. Neuro yeah. Yeah. Oh, no, 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 not at all. No, but I want to say it, it's, I don't, I don't know. Well, I do know you need to not, I'm, I'm talking to the people who might be listening and watching who are like, I have no idea what these are. Yeah. There is no shame in memorizing them and practicing mm -hmm. them yeah. until you feel comfortable. There's no shame in walking in on Monday with that checkered book and be like, guys, yes. we're all going to learn something. <laughs> this Lisa found this book. It, it has all of these rhymes in it. Yeah. And I laughed all weekend and I want us to share this together. Yeah. Oh, that would be an amazing Monday morning. There's nothing wrong with that. You don't got to be an expert. Uh -huh. And, and I think that gets maybe a little easier as you get a little older, yeah. of, you know, when the kids, cause they do, they'll throw something at you. You're like, you know what? I don't know the answer to that. Don't make it up. Mm -hmm. Say that's Let's find great. out. You know what? I don't know. Yeah. 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 Cause that's modeling the learning process instead of pretending it's all easy. And pretending um, that you and pretending that you're infallible. Yeah. And yeah. as you turn on to page eight, 
and you start reading one that maybe you as an adult have never heard before, there could be three kids who already know that that's one, true. Yeah. Right. And so then, then they could become then the facilitator of some of that. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, was there more in the article that you wanted to get to? Cause I know we kind of started that with that, the idea of that being our focal point, And then we kind of have only quite referred honestly, to it a couple of times, but quite honestly, what I was intrigued by was, uh, doing a little bit of the origin of all mm-hmm. of it because, you know, and, and, and that it doesn't need to be a cute activity that, yeah. that reading it and memorizing it and playing with the language can be enough. Mm-hmm. Don't be in a yeah. hurry yeah. to jump just, you know, don't Google mother goose activity extensions. Please don't do that. You don't yeah. need that. You don't need that. Um, yeah. um, I, I, I think we've said it in that this is more of that maybe academic rationale mm-hmm. for what Mem Fox so eloquently summed up yeah. in, in two, in two sentences. And yeah. so if you're going to read one or the other, read, read reading, reading magic, magic by Mem Fox. Reading magic. <laughs> Yes, 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 yes. Is is that the book where she says how her daughter started to read in kindergarten and a teacher was like, what were you doing? Yeah, and she I think was so. like, yeah. In 1975, our daughter Chloe came home from school <laughs> saying, I can read. But yeah. What did you do? What method did you use? I didn't. I didn't. She said, what did you do? Said the teacher. I read to her. <laughs> I read to her. I read to her. I read to her. Yeah. It was just enough to be together. Oh, yeah. I love, I love Mem Fox. Me if you're too. not familiar with Mem Fox, everything she's ever written is absolutely. Yeah. And she has a website with videos and um, like short videos of her doing nursery rhymes and songs and also videos of her talking about specific literacy concepts and, and storytelling, especially like tips for, for being a good storyteller or story reader. Um, I did appreciate that the academic article, um, it, it did give some clear definitions on some of the like phonemic awareness yeah. and alphabetic principle. Yeah. So if you do need to blow the dust off some of that, that, that was this is good for that. very handy. Mm-hmm. Um, I thought it wasn't too, mm, too technical, you yeah. know, it gave pretty easy definitions that you could probably like lift out and then share that or put on sense. a piece of paper or a cheat yeah. sheet or crib sheet or whatever. Yeah or whatever for that. Yeah. The other thing I'll say about reading magic is that there's a whole chapter about why phonics only doesn't work yeah, and, and why it's, it, it's unrealistic to expect that a phonics only approach is going to be what children need to be. And anything um, only readers. approach yes. I think is probably. Yeah. But, but community. phonics is such a quick go-to and such a, um, I guess understood to be the standard. And mm-hmm. so, so, so I think a lot of programs do rely on it, on it only and call that, you know, we did our, we did our literacy for 10 minutes because we went through the phonics <laughs> um, uh, curriculum. Fragmented, compartmentalized. You got to talk, having conversations yes. and reading books and, and, and really having conversations. Yes. Right. Not just closed questions, yeah. fake questions. Yes. No questions. Yeah. You know, I changed my, um, my attitude about teachers having personal conversations while they're caring for children after, cause I used to get really annoyed by that because you're here for the kids. And of course I I'm not saying that they should just have their own conversations all day long and ignore children. But I read when I reread the great disconnect by Michael Gramling, um, he talked about how they hear that vocabulary. They hear that language that you're using. That's a much more natural conversational yes. tone than when you're talking to children and you're, and you're in your teacher scripts. So, um, so don't stop having conversations with your coworkers. Um, and so I had to change my attitude a little bit and find a middle ground <laughs> because, um, because I think that's, that's true. When we're talking to children, it's either mostly directed directive or it's um, fake. fake, or we have that teacher tone of voice and we're using the teacher shorthand phrases um instead of just having real conversation and that impacts their their literacy Mm -hmm. their language development and their reading development yes i agree and now i'm actually recalling that quote something about why teachers sound so dumb when they're talking to the children (laughs) yeah (laughs) i'm gonna have to read it again because i just (laughs) recorded with um with liz about a quote from that book. And I'm going to have to give it a four, three. I think. Yeah. I think we, we all have a couple on our shelf that are falling apart. You uh-huh. at some point need to buy another copy because yep. you've highlighted the entire thing 14 yeah. times. Already. Spines falling apart and the pages are falling out. <laughs> yep. Definitely. Yep. Oh, that's fun. That's all right. Fun. All right. Last thoughts about nursery rhymes or anything else you wanted to, you're the one who's been prepping since four in the morning. 
Well, I think probably a lot of the prepping I did in case we went down that path was, you know, did you did you want to do a little bit of a l lighter exploration of some of the origins? Oh, sure. Where some of that. them they came from. But um, maybe you maybe we'll do a, a second follow up. Oh, that would be fun. Well. Let's do that, because then I can read some some read up on some of those, too, and be ready for it. <laughs> yeah, let's do that. Let's do that. That's cool. Plus, OK, plus we've been talking in their ears for a, a, a while long time now. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. And I have to go to the bathroom. So it works oh, out well, perfectly. There we go. That's an organic close. Isn't it? <laughs> all the audience knows all my business. Um, all right. Well, thank you, Lisa. This was so fun for having me and uh, you're so smart and so smart. Uh, I love having you on the show. I love talking to you, nerd. I miss you. <laughs> I miss you too. All right. Thanks everybody for listening to another episode of that early childhood nerd. Goodbye. Bye-bye.